Hi, my name is Jill and welcome to The Void, the show where I have an existential crisis in public. Let me just start with the story that inspired this episode. I met a boy. What I also did was lose my shit. Planning more than a week ahead makes me want to crawl out of my skin. But with him, I was thinking about marriage and babies. Intense things that people say should not be talking about. I did all the things. I even offered to wait on him like a forlorn Disney princess. Mind you, I don't even wait for the water to get warm before I jump in the shower, let alone wait for a human being. Are you out of your mind? And the worst thing of all, I made a Pinterest board with him for our future furniture. <laughs> That's how bad it was. I was making Pinterest boards for future furniture. Basically the whole thing was invasion of the body snatchers. Jill was no more just alien plant spore. <laughs> I was being taken over by a force that had nothing to do with me. Bottom line, it wasn't pretty, boys. I ran the moron marathon. I handled it in the worst way possible. <laughs> okay, so I lost my shit, right? Here's the thing. I've been single for seven years and it has been fine. I've dated a total of two and a half people. So it's safe to say I prefer being single over the hassle of trying to meet someone who can go to the night shop when I have cravings and I don't want to go outside. Being single this long is something most people will never experience or not until they're really old and widowed or something. I kind of took a weird kind of pride in it, in my ability to do life alone. I have really felt like I had progressed as a person that I had grown and that I was a whole new version of myself. But me going full Stepford wife on this man made me realize that I don't know shit about dating or relationships. It's painful, but I realized I learned nothing. Or at least I learned nothing in interpersonal respect. I have no idea what a healthy relationship looks like in practice, you know, or healthy courtship. I got so comfortable being alone that I stopped experiencing these interpersonal contacts, even if they were fleeting. I just stopped doing any of that. I stopped meeting new people. I just stopped going on dates and I stopped experiencing relationships. Basically, I stopped practicing. And because of that, no one made me face my demons. I didn't have to be better for anyone. I was never challenged. I didn't grow as much as I didn't have anyone close enough to me to call me on my bullshit. It's really easy to trick yourself into thinking that you've changed or progressed when there's no one around to tell you you haven't. There are already, oh, Jesus knows how many videos and uh, articles and listicles about how awesome it is to be single. But I wanna talk about the cold hard truth that somehow no one talks about when it comes to singledom, long-term singledom. So I'm talking at least three years. When does being single stop being healthy? When does it stop contributing to your growth and starts preventing it? When are we really happily single? And when are we just freakishly scared of intimacy? And do we ourselves have enough insight to know the difference? I really feel like being single for a long time doesn't have any evolutionary benefits. So my hypothesis is that there has to be more to it. In my personal experience, being single at some point becomes the law of diminishing returns in practice. There's only so much you can learn about yourself under these circumstances. After that point, it just starts being less beneficial in every way. It stops feeling like it's helping anything. At least that's how I feel. So let's get really real about being single, especially because we live in a society that values or that seems to value detachment. It has become cool to reject your needs for intimacy and closeness. It's almost not in vogue to be emotionally invested in another person. So I want to talk about it from a realistic perspective. It reminds me of a poem by Charles Bukowski, famous alcoholic slash infant terrible. When nobody wakes you up in the morning and when nobody waits for you at night and when you can do whatever you want, what do you call it? Freedom or loneliness? Is being single for the long term really a choice? Which brings me to my next point. We all have that friend, and admittedly I've been that friend, but I've changed my ways. We all have that friend who's like, oh my God, I can't find a date. Every man out there is a psychopath. 
and you know he doesn't call his mother and i'm going to live in a shoe seriously every person every person you've dated is a maladaptive psychopath let's take a closer look at this phenomena we have to i feel like a, a cultural obligation to unpack this narrative as kids we had needs and our parents were merely mortal, so they weren't able to meet all our needs. Even the best parents sometimes cannot meet their kids' needs. So we all walk around with unmet needs left from our childhood. What makes us different is the amount of unmet needs we all have and the intensity of them and how they came to be. It's one of the reasons why we meet a lot of people throughout our lives, but there's only a handful of people that turn you into the psychopath I was, the one who started talking about babies. Why is that? Because we feel romantically attracted by someone who mimics the pattern of love we receive from our parents. You know how when you're in a relationship, all of us become more babyish, right? We become a more babyish version of ourselves. We start talking higher. We want to be, we want to curl up in a little ball on our laps. There's a lot more crying. It's because we're all trying to recreate our childhoods, either to return to that unconditional love you received from your parents or to reprocess and rewrite history. So we fall in love with people who are like our parents emotionally. And that's why dating is such an emotionally taxing shit show. That's why your partner's transgressions feel like the most offensive thing in the world. You cannot agree with a friend, but if you're with a partner who does not agree with you that Die Hard is a Christmas movie, which it is, you can get so angry. <laughs> My point is it's so irrational because it's about your inner kid. It's not just him not texting you back, it's you living that time when your dad was supposed to pick you up and he never came. It's not her belittling you, it's you living every time your mom made you feel small and unimportant. Dating is so hard and such an emotional minefield for people who did not grow up under the perfect circumstances. It's a representation of all our deepest needs and our trauma. So the fear of dating and relationships is completely reasonable, especially if you grew up navigating an emotional minefield. What is not reasonable is really believing that every person you've dated is a douche noodle. If you are one of the long-term single people, even if you are in relationships, think about all your exes and about what they all had in common. Because that thing, that one thing they had in common, is what I like to call the key to your emotional castle. It will teach you something about your unfulfilled needs and your childhood. Me, for instance, when I look at the two and a half men I dated, what they all have in common is emotional unavailability. And for the longest time I thought, why? Why am I so unlucky? How is this possible? There are garbage. I can't help but to look at myself and be honest. And that's when I realized they were all emotionally unavailable because I was emotionally unavailable. I wouldn't know what to do with a relationship if it slapped me in the face and called me a bitch. And to not admit that would require unawareness, something I unfortunately do not have. In fact, I have so much self-awareness that I regularly buckle under the immense weight. I also have terrible knees. So back in the day, being alone equaled death. There was no way for us to survive without other people. And loneliness was designed to herd you back to a group to make sure that you're safe. There's two types of loneliness. There's transient loneliness and chronic loneliness. Transient loneliness lasts a day at most or a couple of days at most. And it's a loneliness that is fleeting and it's usually a result of something concrete happening. It's kind of like, um, when you scroll through Instagram and you see your friends meeting up without you, it's a transient sting of loneliness. Then you have chronic loneliness. And chronic loneliness is the result of situational factors. So have you just moved to Cuba? Or have you been unable to level with someone for a really long time? This kind of loneliness is less innocent. It literally makes your immune system weaker. It accelerates aging. It even makes disease deadlier. Think about it like this. We've all been lonely and it almost feels like it physically hurts. It's because your brain doesn't differentiate between social pain and physical pain. When you cut your finger in the kitchen, the next time you're going to be really careful in the kitchen. The same happens in social 
respect. If you have been suffering a lot of rejection or bad luck in love or you know not feeling understood or keep meeting the wrong people, you become more careful around people. Our brain goes into self-preservation mode, which means that you see hostility everywhere. It really distorts the way you see people and their intentions. So no wonder every person you've dated this year was an asshole. This lack of romantic success lowers your self-esteem and makes you dislike people, which makes you avoid dating, which makes you even more lonely. And so the cycle continues and you become worse at interpreting social signs. You start seeing neutral signs as hostile signs and it just feeds into itself loneliness. It's pretty dangerous. And the worst thing about it is the more you ignore it, the more it becomes a self-sustaining mechanism. Okay, so if you're in the long-term single camp, if you've been single for longer than three years, answer this question and be honest with yourself. Is being single really your choice? I found a study that found a relationship between how your parents raised you and whether you stay single for at least three years or not. Most of you are already familiar with this, but it has to do with attachment theory. How our parents treat us in the first five years of our lives becomes the blueprint of every relationship we have. When, for instance, when your parents are unavailable and reject you, you have this thing called attachment system deactivation. It means that you're not a fan of intimacy and closeness, the whole idea of committing to someone makes you cringe. Casual sex is your comfort zone. And it's not like you don't have needs, but you do whatever you can to suppress them because you don't want to be hurt. When your parents are inconsistent with their response to your needs, you get attachment system hyperactivation. Someone who's only hyperactivated will do whatever they can to make someone not leave. Most people with borderline have, have this type of uh, attachment insecurity. And then we have the hecaton caris of singleville. When caregivers are sensitive and responsive to their baby's needs, infants develop a secure attachment, which just means that these people are secure and confident that when they need something, this person will be there for them. And if that person is not there for them, they'll find someone else who's there for them. Most singles are made up of people who are either deactivated or hyperactivated. The smallest group of singles is the secure group. And they only make up 13.2% of singles. So statistically, I can confidently say that most people are not living their best single lives. So I'm going to ask you again, is being single your choice? Or is it a consequence of something that hasn't been addressed yet? Okay, thanks Jill, but what do we do about this? I have good news and bad news. The bad news is these fears are a base of who we are. Our first frame of reference and therefore very hard to get rid of completely. But the good news is your brain sees no difference between habits like brushing your teeth or your emotional reactions to relationships. You can change habits. If he leaves you a voice note that makes you so angry that you want to scream, do something else. Go call a friend, put your phone away and go paint, whatever the hell it is. Just do something else until the need for homicide has left your body. If you keep doing that, then your split reaction will be replaced. You'll be that crazy person that when they're angry, they'll start cleaning the window. That's a more healthy thing than projecting your disappointments about your parents onto your partner. It takes a lot of work, but it is doable. Change takes time and practice. I told you about my faux pas in the beginning, right? But that is also just a, a strategy to either scare someone away or to emotionally burn myself out so I can kind of retreat. That's not how you're supposed to do things. If you notice yourself going too fast with someone, take a step back. Incremental exposure to the thing you fear the most is the way to go. It should grow and progress in, a, in an organic way. Not letting a relationship progress organically is also sabotaging the relationship. And the last thing is, Screen the people you date. Be disgustingly honest with them. Because, especially because, if you've been single for at least three years, there's a really big chance that you have an attachment disorder.
statistically. So you can't do tomfoolery. You can't do the hot, hot and cold back and forth, will we, will we not shit. Because for a lot of us, it connects directly to our trauma. I think it's also important to remember that you are not sentenced to your attachment style. Your attachment style can change. And it does change when you're exposed to healthy interpersonal relationships. The thing is just that we, like people with attachment disorders, need a little more guidance than safely attached people do. We need someone who understands what it means to love us. A grown ass, securely attached adult. And more than anyone else, we need to grow into being a partner. We need ourselves a whole lot of person with a whole lot of patience who will foster a safe place for us to practice. Because we're not like other people. We're fucked. <laughs> but seriously, Socrates said, know thyself. But the older I get, the more I realize that we get to know ourselves through others. You can get to know yourself through friends a little bit, sure. But a romantic, intimate partner holds up a mirror, a giant mirror, to your bullshit so much that you have no choice but to confront it. Actively avoiding that is actively avoiding getting to know myself. So stay open, keep dating, and give people a chance. Not for them, but for you. So you can meet you. And that was my take on singledom. Send this to all your single friends and ruin their day. This was a really fun one to do. I love making this episode and doing the research. People are not being honest about being single and how that can be a sign of attachment disorders and how it can be a representation of your inability to connect. I just felt it was important. And also I've never heard anyone talk about it. The narrative is like, yeah, queen, yeah, be single, drink a, the whole bottle of wine. There's more to it. I'm really curious about what you think. What do all of your exes or the people you've dated have in common? Like I said, it will be the key to your emotional castle. The reason I started this whole podcast thing is because my friends kept insisting, but also because I really believe that the human experience is kind of like oscillating in and out of a pit of existential despair. And I really believe that by acknowledging, facing and even embracing the void, you can feel it a bit, so the descent is not that deep. Anyway, if you're into light material like this, please like, share, comment, subscribe. <laughs> Thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you in the next one. Bye. It's daytime, and I'm sitting here in a chair talking to myself. <laughs>